Fantastic. Oh, thank you very much for that, Paul. That was a that was a very nice introduction and nice to know that um Ford Hall is is getting out there. Um so yeah, so hello everyone and thank you for inviting me today. Um so I'm from Ford Hall uh, Community Land Initiative, which is an, a community-owned farm in Shropshire. And we are England's commercial community first community owned farm been in community ownership now since 2006 so we're 128 acres of pasture we're a livestock farm and as a family we had tenanted the land here for hundreds of years um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about our history how we came to community ownership and a bit about that story and where Ford all goes now um, just to put it in context um, so we were um, we've been tenanted for hundreds of years. My late father took over the tenancy here in 1929 when he was 14, um, when his dad died. He initially um, turned the farm into a dairy farm. He was one of England's first commercial yogurt producers back in the 1950s and 60s. And he turned the farm organic just after the Second World War. And it's the pastures have remained organic ever since. And throughout that, he developed a system of outdoor grazing called foggage farming, which relies on a, over 70 different plant species without, within our pastures at the farm, which means our livestock can be 100% grazed all year round. Um, and that's a system which we still run today. But it was in the early 90s that Muller Dairy became our next door neighbour. And that was then eventually the downfall of the farm. Ben and I had come along. So... Uh, Dad had remarried after his first wife was tragically killed in a car accident. Um, when I was born, he was 67. When my brother was born, he was 69. So that's what organic living does for you, you see. Um, but what that also meant as we were growing up at the farm, there was obviously that age and generation gap. And when Mullers became our next door neighbour in the 1990s, me and my brother were both still at school. And our parents had begun then fighting eviction notices while the landlord tried to free up the land to sell for development, basically, as Muller's wanted to expand. And um, so throughout the 1990s, all available funds were basically redirected into legal fees and the farm deteriorated as a result of that. And, um, you know, there's also this generation gap, which meant there was a labour shortage on the farm which aided the deterioration, which meant we were then breaking the tenancy agreement. And all of that, to cut a long story short, gave the landlord the ammunition to evict us um, in 2004. So almost 15 years of the family fighting to, st fighting to stay here. Um, during that time, I just graduated from university. My brother Ben had just finished um, studying agriculture at college. And we both came back to the farm originally to spend our last 12 months here as a family, really, while we reassessed what we did next and um, we were very lucky that Mullers had shifted their focus on another piece of land which meant our landlord suddenly had to reassess what he was going to do with this fallen down farm and falling down farmhouse and so at the age of 21 and 19 we managed to secure a short-term tenancy for 18 months and um, 24 hours before the family were due to be evicted um, so we had 11 cows, six pigs, six sheep, no money, no idea what we were doing, and a crumbling farm. And we were like, wow, how cool is this? We've got a farm to run. This is the best thing ever. As you do when you're that age and think you can do anything. And, you know, we knew from the very beginning we only were able to pay the bills was to sell what we had direct to the public. So we set up a little farm shop and slowly built that business up. But throughout this time, we did a lot of community consultation as well. And we look back in the farm's history and actually we could see that throughout its evolution, whatever activities had gone on at the farm, it was when people were involved. That's when it had its most life. That's when it was most successful. And it was um, it, as people stopped being involved with the farm in whatever way that was, whether it be people working here or visiting or enjoying the site, even Ben and I could see that's when the farm kind of lost its heart and its life. So we started to bring this back through conversations and through, as a result of that, doing activities on the farm with our local community. And really it was anything that we could think of or that they wanted to do at the farm, from farmers markets to storytelling, to guided walks, to art days. And it was through all of this that we essentially asked the local people what they wanted from the farm, both then and in the future. And we then told them what we wanted from it as farmers and it's by putting those two things together that we came up with this idea of a community ownership scheme. Um, and so um, throughout this tenancy period, we came up with the concept of a community ownership scheme. 
um, because the community said they wanted to be involved with the farm, they wanted to safeguard it, they wanted to stay, it to stay organic, they wanted to be able to buy produce from it, and they wanted to be able to use it and visit it. But they weren't farmers and they didn't want to farm it. And my brother was like, great, because I want to be in a farmer, please. Um, and so we thought then that a community ownership scheme where the community owned the farm and utilised it as a community resource, but also rented that land out to a tenant farmer to run his own business and livelihood from it would work. So we looked around for the legal model that would match all of those needs together, um, which was an industrial and provenance society. And that's now been usurped by the Community Benefit and Societies Act 2014. So we became what now is known as a charitable community benefit society. And within that structure, it's a one member, one vote, not one share, one vote. So it remains completely democratic as an organization. Um, shares can't be traded on the stock exchange or anything like that, but they are withdrawable shares from the society and they're lifelong shares. And we set the minimum price of our shares at 50 pound. Um, and we then tried to get negotiate the option to buy the land from the landowner, uh, which we eventually got. We extended our tenancy. We then tried to get ourselves incorporated, which took about six months because um, these legal structures weren't really widely used or recognised back then. So it was all quite novel. Um, well, it was quite old, actually. It just wasn't really very well understood or used. Um, and it left us then with six months to raise £800,000. So we kind of started our journey and carried on our journey in the same way, which was opening the farm gate, allowing people to get involved, taking people's ideas on board, holding a strong vision, but being really flexible as to how we achieved that vision. And that's what opened up doors along the way. You know, we carried on holding events and kept holding volunteer days where we would do conservation or work across the farm that would open the farm up to be more accessible and safe for the community to come and visit. And we held one volunteer weekend. It was um, it was in the February of 2006. We'd raised about £30,000 and it was two months into our fundraising. I'd never seen that kind of money in my life before. So obviously I was pretty excited. Um, and uh, we'd set up a bo set of board of directors, which is a voluntary board. And every so often we'd meet and they'd offer support and advice wherever they could. And they were like, oh, Charlotte's great. You know, we raised £30,000 in the first two months, but we've still got four months left to raise £770,000. Like, how on earth are we going to do it? And, you know, there's me and my young naivety going, I know, isn't this great? This is going really well. And there's them going, oh, this doesn't add up. Um, anyway, we carried on. As I said, we had a volunteer weekend that February and we actually had about 50 people that came from right across the country. We did a whole lot of tree planting, we did some hedge laying and we helped to we fence this area off from the trees. And this is just one story that really epitomises how it succeeded. You know, one guy had seen what we were doing, um, I think, in a newspaper article, was interested in organics and cared about land not constantly being developed upon, wanted to come and learn a little bit about it helped plant some trees and helped hang, put a gate post in and hang this gate to fence off the area from the livestock. Came all the way up from London two weeks later with his family to show them the gate he'd helped to put in. And my brother Ben was like, oh my gosh, these people are mad. You know, if you're that excited about a gate, there's loads of gates that need to go in. But of course, it wasn't the fact that he simply put this gate in, but the fact that he got involved with a project which he was then really passionate about. And he was then completely engaged with it because he contributed practically towards it. And he wanted to share that with his family and friends. And this story just replicated itself where people got enthused and they all became their own catalysts. But Christoph, this gentleman, was quite a key one because he not only did he send letters and emails out to friends and family trying to get them to buy shares in the farm, but he also went knocking on the doors on his street. And one of the ladies on his street happened to be a journalist for The Telegraph. And um, so we got, subsequently got a phone call from The General Telegraph, you know, asking our permission to write an article on us. And then they're going, you know, yes, please, that would be great. And this article eventually came out in the middle of April 2006. So by the middle of April, we'd raised £77,000 and all the local press were following it through. They were amazing. We would send them updates and photographs on a regular basis, weekly basis. We were in the local paper and um, we eventually got this article in the Telegraph 
and it was the middle of April. We had two and a half months to still raise over £700,000. And it was the front page of um, the weekend supplement on Easter Saturday and another full page inside that. In fact, the, pe- the story, which was called The Fight for Fortal Farm, is still on the Telegraph website today. Um, and it snowballed so much thereafter that we had to get an extra phone line installed in the house to cope with the volume of calls that continued to come in, you know, for weeks after this article. And a lot of press picked it up off the back of it. We were in The Guardian, The Mail, The Express, The Observer, um, Country Living magazine, some international press. It went in The Japanese Times, a Greek eco magazine and various others, which suddenly meant it went global. And um, and shares just flooded in from so many people for so many different reasons. Um, and yes, the story of me and Ben was really key to it, but also what we were experiencing, others had experienced or others had followed. And so actually that emotional journey and that story within it was had connections to so many people for so many different reasons that that's what they were aligning to, as well as the future vision of reconnecting back to their food and supporting a project that was going to be looking after the land and producing things in a healthy way with animal welfare and so forth. So ever since then, the 1st of July 2006, um, the farm's been collectively owned by over 8,000 community shareholders. Um, We offer a tenancy to Ben as the tenant farmer, but we're here also on the site using a community resource. So we run things like the cafe, Arthur's Farm Kitchen, we do weddings, um, we do family events, we have free open access for the public through our trails, which open at various times depending on how wet everything has been. Um, we run a youth project that supports vulnerable young people. We have a care farm that supports adults with learning disabilities. We do school visits. We have yurts, which we rent out for glamping, um, parties and functions. We offer residentials for schools and youth groups, as well as yoga retreats and other activities. So they kind of the list is wide ranging. We also do social prescribing, which in the past has worked with people that are um, struggling with rural and social isolation and more recently we're starting to work with people who are on their cancer journey so it really does vary depending on the needs of our community but the heart of that is using the land the food um, and the um, and those green spaces to benefit people in lots of different ways and the heart of that is the sustainability of the food system so we've invested ever since the farm's been in community ownership you know, over a million pounds back into the farm, which has uh, largely has come from a result of our of our members, whether it be fundraised from our members or through our members helping to leverage in additional funding. Um, we've renovated the buildings, which Paul and Anna saw where the cafe and farm shop is. A couple of years ago, we built a straw bale building. So at the heart of everything we do is sustainability. So using things like straw, hemp, shingle roofs, renewable energy, natural clay paints, lime plasters, sheep soil insulation, recycled car tire foundations, you know, a whole list of different things. It's all about making sure our message and our values are being lived through everything that we do. Um, And that we work in partnership with our tenant farmer through investing in conservation um, and wildlife activities on the farm to improve the resource we base we have as well. What is key to making it work and kind of, I guess, what we've learned is um, people really do want farms to succeed. Um, They want to be part of that journey and they feel empowered when they're part of that journey, because I think there's a massive frustration of the way the system has been and is and is going um, and where the health of people and the land is going. And actually, all we really did was gave people an avenue to practically Um, support that and to do a real positive action it wasn't really a very hard sales technique that we had to do and what we've learned from it which we had no clue when we started off was actually how empowered that simple 50 pound share has made people feel you know we still have people that have visited visited the farm for the first time and they bought their share back in 2006 and they come with so much joy and excitement and a feeling of being proud that they have helped everything here succeed and they get as much from it as sometimes more, you know, than, than as we get from it. Um, and that's been a real eye opener for us. 
And I guess along that journey, as I said, you know, we've had a real clear vision, but we were always listening to people, open to changing that journey, as long as we were all heading in the same vision and direction. But the most important part of it was about sharing that journey and being authentic as we were sharing that journey, allowing ourselves to be vulnerable, you know, with the story and the difficulties and the challenges, as well as sharing the successes and being realistic as a result around that, but always being positive about what the outcome might be, but never being restricted as to what the outcome might be. Um, and as a result of that, we just continue to evolve. And I think one of the important things that we've learned over the last kind of five to 10 years is how important our values are to make sure that we are sharing them and living them and embedding them throughout our staff team, but throughout every activity that we do. So we've kind of really crystallized some of the wording from them to make sure as an organization we've grown and our staff team has grown. Those values are really strongly embedded. And I think that's given us a real strength and authenticity as well as we've grown and moved forward. But it's also something that we're constantly reviewing and consulting with our members so that they are on that journey with us and we're getting that feedback from them. You know, are we doing the right thing? Are we in the right place? Do you want us to do anything different? You know, and it's really important that it's not just their share back in 2006, but that are on that journey right throughout. And as a result of that, we did um, a survey with our members 10 years on um, to find out how engaged were they 10 years later? Were, was it, you know, and we did a survey back in 2006 and you're quite right, right Paul, is that survey came back and said, it was the Charlotte and Ben part of it, you know, that we got involved. But it wasn't Charlotte and Ben. It was a fact Charlotte and Ben shared their story and allowed people to be involved with it. And it doesn't have to be Charlotte and Ben. It can be anybody else. And actually, I've worked with lots of other community farms since. And those that are successful are those that really share their story and open up the door to people and open and share their vulnerabilities. I was at a community farm not too far away from us before Christmas and we did a community event. They've got over a million pounds to raise to safeguard um, their farm. They didn't know what the community were going to say. They invited about 40 people that came to this meeting in a very cold November um, or December evening in a very cold barn. And, you know, the farmer there was in tears because of the financial situation they're in, which was really touching, although sad. It, it was really authentic and it was really honest. It wasn't just we need to buy this farm. This is all the nice thing we can do for the community. It's actually this is also the struggles. And someone stood up there then and said, here's £10,000, you know, and, and that was because that farmer was willing to be open and authentic and honest about her journey and where they were at. And that truth and honesty is really powerful. Anyway, some of the things that came out of our survey with our members 10, year, 10 years later, a few headlines um, 35 percent of people said that they'd become more locally involved with projects, which is really powerful. Um, but um, hang on, 98 percent said that they would be more likely to support another community farm buyout after their experience with Fordall, which shows that this is a movement that's growing. You know, 76 percent said that their involvement had made them feel part of a wider community of interest. And 86% said that they felt empowered, more empowered with their journey with Ford Hall now than they did when they first bought their shares. You know, a few quotes, it restored my faith in what's possible if you work collectively. And I think that's one of the most important things for us is it's been that power of small actions. And actually, that's a bit key message. That a lot of people have got out their journey with us is that actually if they make a small effort, and everyone else makes a small effort, big change can happen. And that's the empowering part of it. And that's the empowering story for how more of these stories can come, whether it be a football pitch, whether it be a farm, whether it be a community-owned pub or shop or church or whatever, you know, actually these big mountains can be, um, can start to be challenged and faced. Um, so we employ now, um over 100 staff collectively on the farm between us and our tenant farmer so our tenant farmer has a 100 year tenancy at the farm um, and so he has secure um a secure tenancy from the point of view most tenancies now are five or ten years long i think the average one in the uk is eight years 
in eight years, you can't invest in the soil and expect return at, and expect that farmer to really, sorry, you can't in that time expect a farmer to invest in the soil because if he's not tenanting that farm after those eight years, what assets does he have to take with him? So understandably, most farmers are thinking, how much money can I make over this period so I can take that with me in case I have to move on to another farm after my tenancy ends? And as a result, you end up with a system which is not generated around producing healthy food and nurturing the soil, but it's around generating profit and surplus. And that's where the whole system has kind of gone wrong. Whereas when you do things like put the land in community ownership, you take that value out of the equation and it could be a building or an asset, but it becomes that that asset is there for the purpose. And yes, you need to be financially sustainable, but the purpose is what's driving it. Um, and so as a result of that, we've been able to offer a 100 year tenancy to our tenant, which has devalued our asset in our you know, paper value in our accounts by over 50% because we've got a long-term tenancy. You know, that is fundamentally why they don't exist because it devalues an asset that someone might want to sell for retirement or inheritance. When it's in community ownership, that doesn't matter because community own it for perpetuity and you want a long-term tenant to invest in the land and sustain it. But also suddenly this tenant has this community of people that support an agroecological approach to producing food. And a lot of them might be customers to that farm shop. So you're building loyalty and sustainability into that business. And our tenant, you know, is diversified. So collectively on the farm, we're also employing over 100 local people during the summer months. So we are a big employer in the area. We're generating economic impact for the area. We have over 100 volunteers that come and support us every year. We're running all these different social and environmental um, projects. And we're sharing our learning and our journey with other people that want to follow in our suit so that we're not just a one off. We don't want to be that poor. I don't. And that really upsets me when people um, say that because, you know, that's the mentality that would have stopped us at the beginning of this isn't possible. You know, and actually everything is possible if we all believe in it and if we all make a small contribution towards it. And I think that's where community powership has community ownership has a real place to be. And it's as a result of that that we still sell shares. So our membership is evolving and changing all of the time. You know, every year we elect our um, board members from that membership, which is an incredible bunch of people that help us move forward. So if anyone wants to be a shareholder, you're more than welcome, as well as come and visit us. But also it's why I'm involved with the We're Right Here campaign, which is a campaign for a Community Power Act. And one of the aspects of that act is the community right to buy. But also in there is a community right to uh, manage our spaces and to manage investment. So it is really giving legal rights down at community level for real, true, devolved power. Um, and so, you know, please go on the right here dot org website and pledge your support. You can sign up to receive um, updates on that campaign. Ask your local MPs to pledge their support to it. But what we're trying to do essentially is break down a lot of the barriers that existed for us so it's easier for others to follow in our suit and actually having the community right to buy there is a really important part of that.